This is Live Well Talk on Anticoagulation Therapy. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Union Point Health, St. Luke's Hospital. Joining me today is Carla Huber, a nurse practitioner with St. Luke's Heart Care Clinic. Carla specializes in anticoagulation therapy, which is making the blood thin so it doesn't clot and cause uh, disease, and oversees the Anticoagulation Therapy Clinic, or also known as the CAT Clinic, at St. Luke's. Uh, she joins us now to share more about the clinic and what they do and the benefits of uh, monitored anticoagulation or making your blood thin. Welcome, Carla. Thank you. Uh, you know, how long is the, the, the CAT Clinic, Community Anticoagulation Therapy Clinic? Uh, I remember when the Dr. Levette wrote the grants, you know, I, my life is divided in two things. You know, uh, before we had kids, then prior to the pandemic, then after the pandemic. So I know it was prior to the pandemic, but it seems yes. like how long has it been? Uh, we started in 2005. Okay. And there was really no other anticoagulation clinic in the area um, and very few e even now in Iowa. And we started because it was a safety issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of emergency room visits related to anticoagulation. Um, there's a lot of emergency room visits related to drug interactions or drugs and about 25 percent of those are related to anticoagulation with most of those related to warfarin. 15 percent of all malpractice is anticoagulation related. Yes, yes. So our clinic started from <clears throat> scratch. Uh, it was uh, grant funded at the time um, and now we're actually known as the cardiology anticoagulation clinic. So that cat really kind of stuck around for us. So, um, you know, we're really there to help people um, understand the reasons why they need to take an anticoagulation medicine or a blood thinner, as we talk to our patients about. And um, our staff is all RNs, which I'm very fortunate with. And they are all um, certified in anticoagulation management. How, how, how do you obtain certification? Is there a... Um, there's a course that you can okay. take. All right. um, it's a college course, um, certification course here in the United States. Okay. And there's also an anticoagulation um, forum. Uh, it's uh, actually nationwide. It's called the AC Forum, and they provide um, almost all information about anticoagulation. They have guidelines. They have web um, programs, CEUs. Um, I always say it's all anticoagulation all the time at the AC forum. So, well, you know, the I worked for in between college and medical school. I worked for General Mills in research, and they they we went through this training called Kepner Trago, and it was so beneficial because basically what it was is you, that systems are dynamic. So if you're trending up, don't adjust down because now you're going to overshoot down, and uh, likewise. And, you know, I always, I use those skills. I've used those skills my whole medical career. And it was just, you know, a one day course, but I learned Charles Deming and quality, you know, they yes. went all through that and it was really, and so when you started the cat clinic, I thought, you know, that's, that's good because at that time, you know, people were on Coumadin and multiple physicians in a practice were, you know, managing it um, and all doing it different, rechecking it frequently, changing it frequently. And either the patient was having the doses adjusted too much or having too many blood tests. You know, yeah. I mean, that, that was that was kind of the case. So I, I think it's been a good niche. But do you just see cardiology patients? We do not. Uh, we see patients that come from family practice. Pulmonology is a big referral source for us. Uh, nephrology, internal medicine, um, you name it, they come to us. So for many, many reasons. Um, and you're exactly right with, you know, the trends and such. I mean, that's all we do is anticoagulation. But on the other hand, you know, everything, I always say to my patients, everything in the body is connected. So everything affects warfarin. Um, and it is a difficult medicine to manage. Um, and it's been around for so long that they don't even make Coumadin anymore. Um, so that's interesting too. And anticoagulation has changed a lot in the last 17 years since I've been doing this. Yeah. You know, we now have other medicines for blood thinners too. So that's been really beneficial for the patients, I think. Um, you know, they don't have to go get those blood tests when they're on the newer ones, which are um, Eliquis, Pradaxa, and Xarelto. Um, and those 
newer anticoagulants, we call them DOACs, direct oral anticoagulants, because of how they work. Um, those newer medicines don't need to be monitored with an INR. As a matter of fact, that INR only goes with warfarin. That's what I tell my patients. Um, they don't have to worry about as many drug interactions. They don't have to worry about food. Um, they take the same dose every day. Um, and it's, those medicines are very fast acting where warfarin is a very slow acting medicine. So there's a lot of advantages. And as a matter of fact, the DOACs are now preferred over warfarin for most reasons that patients take blood thinners. So they, they, they don't even make Coumadin anymore? It's no. just all generic warfarin? Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, you still write Coumadin, of yeah, course. Yeah, sure. Know. You know, I, I have an interesting warfarin or Coumadin story. Uh, warfarin stands for Wisconsin Alumni Research Fund. Yes. Because their alumni did it. And I was taking care of a patient and I said, well, I'm going to need to put you on warfarin, Coumadin. And I started explaining her what it is. She goes, oh, I know all about it. I was like, you know all about it? Her dad was one of the researchers. Wow. And this is so funny. She had two, he had two pretty of a secretary. So the mom would not let him work late. So she had, she was in high school. And so he dictated his stuff to her and she typed it up. Oh, for her. It was the greatest story ever. And she's like, no, oh, I know all about Warfarin. I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, you know. Yeah. And I always say to patients, you know, that W stands for Wisconsin. So it's a Midwest product. So yeah. we should be very yeah. proud of yeah. that. <laughs> I, so now, what did they, what did they, I mean, that before anticoagulants, they had nothing, right? I mean. I, you know, I'm not really sure when heparin came around or, you know, what. And I think, you know, back in the day before warfarin, I'm not sure we even knew why patients died. You know, even today, um, venous thromboembolism affects about 900,000 900, patients in the United States every year. And about one in four of those patients have sudden death. So I'm not even sure, you know, back then we even knew. Right. But certainly since warfarin came along, it's a great anticoagulant. It works really well. So. Uh, Coumadin or warfarin uh, has the, uh, you know, a lot of patients call it rat poison. Um, it, but. You know, I think using that rat poison analogy with it always helped me explain to patients that, you know, it, rats aren't stupid. They they come up and they see a bunch of dead rats and they're like, oh, I'm not, probably not going to eat that. And they go away. But warfarin works slowly. Mm -hmm. So they, they eat it and then they take it. Uh, they die elsewhere. Right. So, you know, that kind of reminds patients that this isn't a fast acting drug right. and it's going to take time to work. Um, that was always the holy grail, Zemiglatran. I don't know if you remember that. Yep. Came on the market and was very came off very quickly. It was liver failure, but it was the first attempt to get an oral um, Coumadin, a non monitored Coumadin. Yes. Uh, it's because the blood the blood test is some patients don't mind it. You know, I've had some patients that it's kind of their social outing. And, Absolutely. You know, and they're like, I'll just keep taking it. That's fine. Um, but it, it really is, it helps people not to have to get that test all the time. Correct. So how, how often uh, on these direct oral anticoagulants or the novel, I mean, I think we've settled on DOAX. Yeah. How, how often do you see them if they're on a DOAX? Um, we really do follow up by phone with those patients in most cases. Because uh, you got a minor kidney function. Correct. And, right, right. Yes. So, you know, up front when I'm talking to patients about putting them on a direct oral anticoagulant, I do mention that we, we want to make sure that we do a hemoglobin. Um, at least annually, and that's for anybody on any anticoagulant. And then we do need to monitor their kidney function because some of these medicines are dosed based on their kidney function. So it's really important. And we've actually found a few patients that have wanted to go from warfarin to a direct oral anticoagulant um, that maybe they haven't, they're a younger patient and maybe they haven't had their creatinine checked for some time. And we've actually found some issues. And so we've had to send them on to nephrology um, for, hmm. you know, referrals and such. Now, newer drugs are expensive. Tell us, tell us about some of the options for patients to, uh, uh, to, to deal with that expense. Yeah, yeah there's actually uh, quite a few options patients have. And we actually do what I call a lot of social work with our patients as well. Um, and that involves making sure that you can afford your medicine. Right. So um, there's actually some programs through the drug companies that the patients have. Um, and that is applications for patient assistance. And we have found that about 30% of our patients on a direct oral anticoagulant may qualify for free medicines. Um, we use the um, His Hands Free Clinic here in the city and also the um, Community Health Free Clinic. 
They both have patient assistance programs. They both have pharmacies. And sometimes we can send patients there in the short term while we're waiting for these applications to come through or be approved. Um, all of the DOAC companies have a 30-day free trial that we can start with these patients and then you know, decide whether they qualify for patient assistance. And then there's some other programs um, through um, the drug companies that um, some people may get it at a reduced cost. So there's quite a few options. So when, they, when these newer medications first came out, um, you know, they had to prove that they, Coumadin looked a little like there's more bleeding complications. The studies, when you started to pick them apart, said, wow, well, they really had more sicker patients, if you will, in the Coumadin study. So of course they had more bleeding complications. So at, at this point, where we at as far as Coumadin compared to the newer agents, uh, as far as complications and uh, efficacy? Yes, so in the drug studies, um, all of the DOACs were compared to warfarin. And they reduced the risk of stroke for our AFib patients by about 70%. For our venous thromboembolism patients, um, the reduction was about equal in the risk of um, clots. So um, efficacy is about the same. Um, safety, there's actually less bleeding overall um, with the direct oral anticoagulants, which is good. We always want to see less bleeding. I think that's what patients have the most fear of is bleeding um, because they remember, you know, their grandma or their grandpa was on warfarin and they were, you know, had nosebleeds or they bruised or, you know, had something about warfarin that they didn't like. So that's a benefit, I think, to these newer um, anticoagulants. And I tell patients, you know, now you have a choice. Um, you know, these um, Eliquis and Xarelto are the two most common ones that we use here in the area. And I and the cardiologist both um, prescribe. Um, and so we have to have a shared decision-making um, discussion with our patients. You know, what's most beneficial for you? And I think the great thing is that they have a choice. And yeah. um, we do have to talk about cost. Um, and we do talk about cost. Um, so I think one of the great things now is that patients do have a choice. I think that's what I really try and um, you know, bring to the forefront is, you know, you don't have to be on warfarin. You can be on something else. I, I, in my practice, 25 years, I've always been pretty aggressive at going for the anticoagulation. You know, talking to the patient saying, you know what, bleeding it, I can potentially treat. Correct. I can't undo a stroke. Uh, and, you know, and most patients are like, okay, I'll go with the bleeding risk. I don't want to have a stroke. Cause I think people aren't, my patients that I've encountered in general, aren't afraid of dying. They're afraid of half a stroke that leaves them dependent mm -hmm. and a burden on their family. That's what they don't want. Right. They don't want to leave their loved ones like that. So, you know, it's always been a good conversation to go on these anticoagulants. And I, I, I've always thought people responded really well to it, but there are people listening that are like, oh, well, I'm getting my iron checked all the time. What are conditions where you can't be on the DOAX? I know they've narrowed it down, but is it uh, uh, mechanical valves? And Yes. So patients with mechanical valves, whether it's in the aortic or the mitral position, um, we have a few tricuspids too, um, they cannot be on an oral, a direct oral anticoagulant because they really haven't been studied. As a matter of fact, Pradaxa actually did a study um, in Europe, and they had to stop the study early because patients um, were having more bleeds and more clots. Um, the University of Iowa actually is now doing a study uh, with Eliquis, and these um, there's some newer um, aortic valves called ONX, and there's some doing some study with warfarin compared to Eliquis with those um, patients. But patients that have had a serious bleed um, while on an anticoagulant may not be somebody that we want to leave on an anticoagulant. Um, most bleeds, when patients get put on a blood thinner, occur within the first 30 days. That's the most common time for a bleed to occur, is within the first 30 days of starting a blood thinner. And that's because something's usually brewing, like an it, it, ulcer in the stomach, yeah. and then, um, then they bleed because we put them on a blood thinner. Right. Um, so there's not a lot of patients, you know, it's really, you really got to look at their risks and the benefit profile. Um, there are some scoring tools that we use. Um, one is the Chad's VASC scoring tool that we use to look at their risk of stroke. And then we use the Hasbled to look at their risk of bleeding. 
And so if their has blood score is high, you know, they may be okay to go on an anticoagulant. However, we need to have a really frank discussion with them about, you know, what to look for for bleeding. So I would say there aren't a lot of patients that can't take a DOAC, but there are some, yeah. or even a blood thinner. Yeah. Uh, let, you know, let's talk, before we move on to the, to talk about uh, COVID-19 and the blood clotting that was seen with that, but let, vitamin K, Coumadin is a vitamin K dependent. It, you know, my experience always was, I tried to tell patients, it's you don't avoid vitamin K, you just have a consistent amount. Because it never failed, they would avoid it, mm -hmm. right? You dose their cumin for it, it's run perfect. They go on vacation, they get off their kind of vitamin K depleted yeah. diet, they come back and it goes down. Mm -hmm. So they, then you up the dose and then they go, oh God, I should have shouldn't have had that vitamin, all those salads. And then they cut that out again and now you're now it's up, you know? And so uh, do, do you counsel people on dietary uh, measures to take when they're on these medications? We absolutely do. And my whole um, teaching really revolves around consistency with vitamin K. Yeah. Now, the other thing that we see is um, around the time of holidays is alcohol intake. And so we have to have a frank conversation with our patients about that too. You know, we just had Labor Day. Guess what happens on Tuesday and Wednesday after Labor Day when patients get their INRs checked? They're high. And so, um, you know, we have the conversation with them. We ask them about, you know, did you have a little extra alcohol over the weekend? Well, yeah, I did. And so we go from there. Um, and, you know, I have to say my nurses know our patients up and down. Um, they've known the patients for years um, and we're very frank with them. Um, and they know they can call us and talk just about anything um, because we'll help them and we'll help them get, you know, if it's not something related to their anticoagulation management, we'll get them to the right source. Yeah, it's a good touch point. It is a very good touch point. Yes. Well, COVID-19. Yes. Um, you know, there was, I've, I've remained in the group of, uh, for the patients that are in the ICU and the critically ill, moderate to severe, definitely anticoagulate. And I've kind of treated it like a total joint anticoagulating for 21 to 28 days after they go mm -hmm. home. That pendulum's kind of swung back and forth. And I know we're leaning to it, but ha did you see increase in blood clots with I, during the COVID, during yes, the pandemic itself, yeah, I definitely did. Yeah, um, and I think the most uh, the most I saw was between November of last year and April of this year. Um, these were all younger patients, um, and I'm talking 30, 40, 50, early 60s. Um, they were all either under vaccinated or unvaccinated. All had other comorbidities as well, um, and you know, blood clots are preventable. Um, venous thromboembolism, whether it's in the lungs or in the arms or legs, um, many of those are, are uh, you know, we can prevent them. So, um, you know, getting the vaccine is a very important thing. But yes, I did see yeah. an increased number of patients. Well, and then there's controversy, you know, is it the vaccine associated with oh. that? Which is, it's hard to, that's that's really hard to say because COVID so prevalent, uh -huh. you know, that people could be having blood clots related to COVID and Absolutely. they also happen to get the vaccine. I mean, 74% right. of the Lynn County is vaccinated. So, it, so it, you know, you could draw relationships to anything at this time. You know, it'll be interesting five years from now. We have a bunch of data and we can look at yeah. it and, and answer some of these questions. Yeah. And I was surprised. I looked at the prevalency of VTE in the United States and it's one per 1,000. So it's pretty prevalent without COVID. Pretty common. One per 1,000? Yes. The venothromboembolism blood clots. Yeah. Know, that's a... Yeah. So what? how did you get roped into starting the clinic? Well, I actually, um, in my career, I've always been looking for opportunities. So when I saw this opportunity appear, you know, I applied and um, I was hired to do this. I did a lot of research even before I started the position about anticoagulation management. And it has really come to be probably one of my favorite, um, most rewarding things I've done in my career. Um, because again, as I said earlier, you know, everything is connected in the body. So everything is affected by anticoagulation. Everything affects anticoagulation. Um, and it's a specialty clinic. 
within a specialty clinic. Um, and also I just had some really good nurses that I've worked with yeah. and it's really, and really great patients. Um, and I've been, had the opportunity to, when I see those patients in the office, I'm able to really sit down um, for anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes with those patients and really talk to them and really know them well. Yeah. And that's been very rewarding to me. That, that's the safety aspect alone of it. I've always thought highly of, you yes. know, and then, and then you extend that into compliance. So. Carla, thank you for joining us. Uh, once again, this was Carla Huber, a nurse practitioner with St. Luke's Heart Care Clinic. Uh, for more information on the anticoagulation clinic, as well as cardiology, visit unipoint.org backslash C-A-T, uh, CAT Clinic. That's C-A-T-C-L-I-N-I-C. -I -I Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.